Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I'm, I'm very passionate about this, this, this because it relates to my research as well as all the research that's gone into the Old Ways New Roads exhibition and, and book. Um, and I'm going to focus on just a few works uh, and a specific aspect of panoramas and landscape. Uh, I will if my screen moves. Okay, here we go there. Um, I, I'm particularly looking at artists of this period who, who uh, was, were panoramas. They were decorative artists. They were theatrical scene painters, and as well as landscape painters and portrait painters. And they, they spent their career moving along the new roads created, which is discussed in this book, uh, and to and from and around Scotland, down to London, to Dublin, and across the country. Um, and I'm going to focus on two of those artists in particular and their contribution to this period is Alexander Naismith and John Knox. Now, there are many more who are actually all from Scotland. Uh, Jake Moore, again, is featured in the, in the book and the exhibition. Uh, John Jock Wilson, David Roberts, uh, Williams, William Grieve, who ended up back in London, and then later on, Clocks and Stanfield. So I'm just going to give a little kind of time scaler of what I'm talking about really and I'm going to start actually not with panoramas but with uh, with theatre and, and painted scenery because both painted scenery and uh, scenic art in general were one way in which the public could see the scenery of Scotland or, or the scenery the landscape of the urban landscape as well as the, the uh, natural landscape outside so if we go back to Alexander Naismith's first foray into the theatre, it's in 1792 that he paints his first uh, back cloth scenery uh, and stock scenery for the Dumfries Theatre. Now, sadly, as in many cases with, with scenic art and, and panoramas, there's, there's very, very little um, direct evidence, certainly no, so no, so no cloths or uh, panoramas themselves, but there are there is relevant information in terms of sketches and paintings that relate to, to the panoramas. Now, going forward a little bit in 1788 is the Theatres Act, and I'll come back to the importance of this act in terms of uh, the theatre and, and, again, landscape painting and seeing the landscape of Scotland. Now, in 1805, Naismith uh, was commissioned to paint the scenery for the uh, Theatre Royal Glasgow, and it's described as a magnificent view of Clyde looking towards Dumbarton Rock, and there's a great long description of this work which describes something that later Naismith comes to paint as an easel painting, and here's uh, the Glasgow uh, Hunterian painting of a similar scene. Now, this is all we have to, to have an idea of what it would have looked like, the actual scene painting for the stock scenery at Glasgow Royal. Later on again, uh, Naismith, in, later in his career, has been working both in, as a landscape painter, uh, as, as a scenic artist, uh, as an architectural um, uh, designer, uh, as a landscape designer of, of an exterior landscape for, for the big house. And in every field he was working, but the, a very key part of his theatrical landscape was when he was uh, commissioned to uh, paint for the uh, Heart of Midlothian uh, scenery. Now, in fact, this was first painted by William Reeves, who was in London at the time, who based his his sketches on those of Naismith. And this is the, the three, again, this is all we have to imagine what this landscape and these images, in this case of, of, uh, of, Gla of Edinburgh, would have looked like at the time. And we have one watercolor, was well, actually, actually the set in, 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 in uh, London, watercolor painting, in this case, of William Reed's interpretation based on Naismith's earlier sketches. So something similar to this was what the audiences in uh, London would have seen at Covent Garden of the scenes of Scotland. And it, for some of them, that may be their first experience of any form of Scottish landscape. Now, the importance of the Theatres Act is it, it not only now we have the, the Royal Theatres, which were the patent theatres, which were allowed to produce um, plays, written, spoken plays rather than uh, just uh, theatrical musicals. And the Theatres Act then allowed provinces to, to have licensed theatres. And that's when the movement of theatres and companies became um, more open. Uh, and so actor scenery, importantly props and costumes, travel by horse and cart across the country. And I'm showing here a particular, not for Scotland, but it's important that was on the way between Edinburgh and Scotland, there were big theatre circuits. And this particular one is Butler Circuit in, in, in Yorkshire and our only remaining Georgian theatre, which is in Richmond, Yorkshire. So this is a period in which they also they coincided the theatre productions and the venues with the great events that were going on. So in our case, Edinburgh and Glasgow uh, fairs, and it would have been two places in which the theatre then came to town, whether it was from London or from the provinces. And there is at that point, people would have seen the landscapes 
um, from other cities and the urban landscapes, but also going the other way to London would have seen the landscapes of Scotland. And so we have an important period where we have uh, the period of panoramas. Now, actually, panoramas, because they weren't theatre, were, were in existence before the Theatres Act and were allowed to, to exist in their own right. And famously, there's the original patent of, of Barker's patent for the for the idea of the panorama of his Edinburgh uh, of his view of Edinburgh from Carlton Hill. And he pretty much has the market in this area in, in, in Scotland because of the patent uh, and in London, too. Uh, his patent runs out and it's actually Alexander Naismith, uh, one of the first to work with Cooper. And they produced another version of the panorama of London from taken from Albion Mills. And that was displayed in Ingham Street in Glasgow. And this patent, the only extant, sorry, not extant, only known uh, occurrence of Naismith painting a panorama at all that we crossed. Now, what's interesting is John Knox, a little younger than uh, Naismith, he paints, almost comes out of nowhere, uh, Knox. He started off as a portrait painter or, or set up as a portrait painter in Glasgow, but soon moves into panoramas. And his famous first panorama in 19, uh, 1809 was displayed in Queen Street, Glasgow. He then moved, and this is the thing, is that the panoramas moved around the country into different venues. It then moved to Edinburgh, to the mound on Edinburgh, and below is the, the press cutting uh, describing that, 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 that actual scene, which we'll talk about in a minute. Then he moves on again to London, to Wigley's Exhibition Room uh, in Spring Gardens, London. From then to Edinburgh, uh, sorry, to, to Dublin, and back to Glasgow. And here we see the last occurrence of this panorama. So over a period of, um, what is that? That's you know, 14 years, this panorama had moved around the country, being displayed at various points, and only often for only a few months at a time. And then we, the panorama isn't mentioned again after this date, but what happens in uh, 1816 is the, we believe is the date in which uh, John Knox painted the easel painting version is a panorama. And this is the only record, visual record we have, apart from the written words on, on these uh, press cuttings, of what that panorama would have looked like and what it, dis what it would have displayed in terms of the city. So here we have, I'm not going to read, read the whole of this. This, this uh, is in, in, in the book, but it's also, it also would be recorded here. But what it describes is the scene that we see of Glasgow from the south side of the bridge all across to the Kirkpatrick Hills and the Campsie Hills, but also the industrial city as well. Um, it's open every lawful day from nine o'clock till dusk because natural light is displayed by natural light at this period from above. And therefore it was a, a day time event rather than an evening event to come to the sea uh, the uh, the panorama. So what would it have looked like? What, what would have the audience have seen at this time? Well, again, we don't have a direct uh, evidence of the buildings because the buildings have no longer survived and there's very few drawings of these buildings. But we can inference from other information from another panorama where we have uh, the series panorama, which was also displayed in Queen Street at the Rotunda in Queen Street. And this is an ex what's called an explanation of the panorama. And I, I think that this information that we have here is you can see the shape of the panorama, we're doing a curve. Details of all, in this case, ships um, were displayed in these explanations. But more importantly, you see this bu balcony area. So you would have, have walked up the stairs uh, at Queen Street and looked from above down onto the panorama. And he would have been surrounded by nearly 360, not, not quite. Now, we know that John Knox's panorama went through to Wigley's in London. And Wigley's, we have a little more information about what it would have looked like. This is a, a sketch of Wigley's. You can hear, see here what, what kind of looks like a greenhouse, which is where the light would have come through to illuminate down onto the, onto the panorama. And there's also a sketch kept in the London Metropolitan uh, Archives, which is very helpful. It's very hard on the screen, but this says 10 foot. So the door was 10 foot. The actual building, if you work out, is around 60 foot in height. And we can see from these drawings that the stairs up to the top. So again, there was a viewing platform that would have been at half height of the building. And then you'd look down onto the scene of, of the panorama. And as is described in the advert, we're talking about 3,000 square foot of canvas would have been visible to you. So you'd been in, in surrounded and immersed in the scenes of Glasgow or Edinburgh or the landscapes of Scotland by where you were in London. And here's the, the oil painting that Knox painted later, was, as we, far as we can tell, was painted later. And the reason why we, it's late is we see within this scene uh, the Roman Catholic Church of St Andrews here. 
Uh, if you carry on out, you can see just the top of Dunbeg in the Campsies, and then out to Ad in the foreground of the Clyde, out to Addison, uh, this side. And then the other side on the North Bank, you go all the way out to the Nelson Memorial out in uh, Glasgow Green, and across to the bank, to the Southside Bank, where the image is painted, or the, the, the panorama is painted as if you're above the painting. But this is all we have, and actually it's a very diminutive painting considering the size of the original panorama. It's only just over one meter in length and 30 centimeters in height. But this is the only evidence we'd have had. Uh, but if you did look at the advert, it describes this scene in its entirety in the panorama. So this is how we, we can imagine the panorama. Now, I can't see my screen. Let me just get my screen up because I want to just show you one little uh, image here, which is a miniature version of what it may have looked like. So it's just to give you a feel. So it would have been in something like this with light above. It would have been wood rock glass uh, and the panorama. You'd have walked in and looked down onto the panorama itself. Here we also have a later lithograph uh, that Knox produced of uh, the scene as seen from that South Bank as well. But again, this is later. So the interesting thing is the relationship between his, his works on paper and print and, and his panorama work. So for me, the, the, it opens up many questions about how a, a painter who's a landscape painter and, and in, in the working in the commercial world of panoramas, which at that period were extremely uh, important in terms of an artist uh, accessing you know, an income, uh, and also the, the tradition at that period of having spectacles that traveled, which was an important thing. And he obviously picked up on this and became very proficient in that. Um, but it does ask a question about the relationship between when he painted which, the small painting, his large panoramas, uh, and actually who helped him paint these panoramas. That's a lot of canvas for one person. And they, he painted them with uh, the next one within a year of his first one. And his, his second panorama uh, to be displayed was actually in, only in 1810, so not much after the first one, was probably his most... Um, famous and uh, significant panorama, which is the view from Ben Loman, taken for within a hundred foot of the mountain top. So the, I, the, he the, is sketching it from this position on the mountain top, uh, and then looking. The, the audience would have seen it from this perspective, as if they were there, surrounded by the hills and, and mountains of Loch Lomond, down into the into the loch on this side, and all the hills going on into the distance. Uh, there are two versions of the oil painting version of this. Now, you might notice for the eagle eyed of you that actually, if you join the two paintings together, which are, are now both framed separately and probably probably were originally two paintings, that it doesn't quite join up. And that's because uh, at some point, I suspect the, the way that these have been set, uh, they would have been separate oil paintings, but there's obviously some slight difference here going on. And that again is interesting. The original panorama would have been continuous. But he painted two versions of these as oil paintings, and it's not until quite a lot later, in in, in nineteen uh, in eighteen twenty nine, that he um, I just read, I read eighteen twenty nine eighteen twenty nine that he actually displayed these uh, as exhibits as oil paintings. And if we look between the two versions as well, we see he displays the wildness of Scotland. So we see the eagle uh, catching a, a, what appears to be either a rabbit or a very small deer. So the wildness and the, the sublime of, of the majestic mountains of, of Ben Lomond, but also the very, not the very domestic, but it was, it was for the tourists to come. It was a place that you could visit. As is shown here, this is the National Gallery's version um, with uh, a girl with a, 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 a book on her sketchbook on her lap, looking out across into the hill. And then this is the version uh, at Glasgow Museums with extra people. And if we look between the two versions, we see this change, this development of this work, which we assume also occurred within the, um, within the panorama as it traveled. For many descriptions of Knox's, it says with extra people, uh, more, more detail. So it was something that was developed. And, and it's possible that he kept these work, these oil painting versions while he worked on the panorama. But the other clue we have to how the panorama would have looked is this uh, explanation again, the only, sadly, the only extant version we have for this particular uh, panorama showing the positions of all the hills uh, with a view. So the, the audience would have gone up into the rotunda would have had a program or a, a description explanation like this, and then would have looked upon the scene and seen that. And so they brought, basically brought the city 
yeah, into their own homes or into their own world, at least within with the city or the landscape into their own world. Now, this panorama traveled uh, again, uh, not quite so much as uh, Glasgow Old Bridge, but this panorama traveled. So again, the world, the world of Scotland and the landscape was brought to the people through these means. And if we look at all the panoramas that John Knox is known to have produced, there's the city of Glasgow, the view of Ben Lomond, and then there was also uh, a, the, a, a, a panorama of Edinburgh, of Dublin, of Moscow was actually what's called a transparency, which is lit from behind, and it was of a, a much more dramatic battle scene. And again, Gibraltar, you know, the, the, this period, dramatic scenes, the a big battles were very much a panorama uh, topic as well. But what John Knox probably did best was that combination of the sublime in, in a theatrical setting in which his panoramas produced together. And his, his easel painting versions of these, you get a glimpse of, of the magnificence that these works would have had at the time. And again, you can see how they traveled uh, across the country from Glasgow and it's only the city of, the city of Glasgow one that went to London, but the others went between Edinburgh, Glasgow and Dublin as well, which had a, its own uh, rotunda. Uh, where many artists display their panoramas. So, so panoramas had this powerful place within the context of old ways, new roads, in that they brought the city or they brought the landscape to the people uh, and possibly along with theatrical landscapes were the first uh, experience people would have had rather than maybe easel painting versions that we, there's all we have left to imagine the, these amazing works. 